Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. I'll just let um, people sign in. I can see the numbers building. So just bear with us for a few minutes as everybody gets on board. Give it another minute or two, if you don't mind waiting. Right, I think let's let's get down to business. We've got a, a decent crowd um, already signed in and hopefully more will join us in due course. Um, thank you everybody for coming along today. Welcome to our second event in our new global seminar series. Um, my name is Jonathan Fennell. I'm president of the Second World War Research Group. Um, we're a group that aims to promote innovative research on conflict and its global aspects and act as a forum for bringing together new perspectives, publicizing, recent and current research, encouraging collaboration across scholarly communities and across academic disciplines, and providing a hub, an organizational hub for conferences, seminars, and other related activities. And I, I think by showcasing the new economics of the Second World War, 75 years on ebook, um, we feel we're meeting a number of these objectives today. So I've got, well, we've got an astonishing uh, trilogy of, of speakers with us. Um, with an amazing range of, um, of experience. We're going to start off with Stephen Broadbury, um, and then we'll go with Joachim Voth and Pauline Grosjean. Um, Stephen is Professor of Economic History at the, Oxford, at the University of Oxford and Director of the Economic History Programme at the Centre for Economic Policy Research. He is a Fellow of the British Academy and is currently President of the Economic History Society. Stephen, by my count, has close to 200 publications. Let's try harder, Stephen. Um, he is co-editor with Mark Harrison of the Economics of World War I um, and the 2018 CPR ebook, The Economics of the Great War. And of course, um, of the Economics of the Second World War ebook that we're going to discuss today. Stephen is going to talk to us about British economic management and performance during the world wars. Over to you, Stephen, please, to kick us off. Right, I'll just... Um share the screen and get the slides up. Um, so, um, well, this, um, this volume um, on the, economic, the, the economics of World War II, 75 years on, um, was timed to um, come out uh, after 75 years after the end of World War II, and it followed uh, an earlier volume that we did um, on World War I. Um, and um, it's sort of divided into three main sections on the preparations for war, the conduct of war, and the consequences. Um, the, the chapter which I'm going to talk about um, uh, lessons learned, British economic management and performance during the world wars. I mean, it, it does focus mainly uh, on the conduct uh, aspect, but of course it, it has um, implications for uh, the preparations and, and the consequences uh, as we'll see. So um, I think it's one of the sort of motivating factors behind uh, the, the joint research that um, Mark Harrison and I have done over the years was 
the feeling that somehow the two world wars don't really get the, um, the attention they deserve in the economic history literature. Um, and so, so there, are, there is a, an absolutely huge literature on Britain during the two world wars, but you know, the economic history of these episodes, we still think um, remains under-researched. And I think there are sort of two reasons for that. One is sort of the economic history literature, you know, most economic historians, certainly writing on the modern period, seem uncomfortable writing about the war. Somehow they treat the war economy as different. So you'll find the literature is really huge on the pre-war, the interwar and the post-war periods, but nobody wants to write on the war periods. Um, and then in the war history literature, I think there are much more uh, attractive priorities for people to research battles, weapons, social issues, administrative issues, um, rather than um, boring old economic issues. Um, so um, uh, th this chapter uh, draws on research with uh, Peter Howlett on British economic management and performance during World War I, and we also wrote on um, World War II, and then this is a sort of comparative chapter. The questions um, that we focus on are really twofold. Um, so firstly, to what extent did economic performance during the Second World War improve as a result of lessons learned from the experience of the First World War? And then secondly, uh, what were the implications of those lessons for long run performance after World War II? Uh, so um, if we compare mobilization uh, during World War I and World War II, uh, this graph sort of puts the two together. Um, you have um, the increase of real GDP um, during the First World War, that's the gray line, and then uh, during World War II, that's the black line. Uh, you can see um, the path of expansion is quite similar. Um, it peaks about five years after the start of the war in both cases. But on the other hand, uh, the uh, real GDP peak is about double the um, World War I peak. Um, uh, so, so it looks as if lessons have been learned. Um, another way of um, looking at this is uh, because wars are waged um, by states is to um, have a look at the increase in government spending. And again, we get a similar picture. Um, the, the expansion in both wars, um, but uh, a bigger expansion, reaching sort of about 50% of GDP uh, in the Second World War instead of just 40% in World War I. Um, so uh, the scale of mobilization was substantially greater and it was also achieved more smoothly during World War II. And that is usually attributed to the lessons learned from the experience of World War I. Uh, so in World War I, you, you had certainly uh, at the start um, an initial aim of business as usual, uh, not having too much disruption of the economy, and that was only gradually chipped away. Um, in World War II, by contrast, plans were already being drafted in the 1930s and could be implemented um, before the war started, really, um, once it had become inevitable, um, that sort of eased frictions and disruption. For example, you had 50 million ration books ready for distribution by September 1939. Uh, so um, state intervention during the First World War was relatively ad hoc until 1917, really. It's very much a reactive approach rather than proactive. Um, and certainly the economic and material burden of the war was initially underestimated. Um, and um, you know, the spread of controls was, was pretty slow compared with World War II. So conscription doesn't get introduced until March 1916, food rationing only in uh, 1918. Uh, so um, in World War II then, governments really believed that controls had been adopted too slowly in the First World War, and so they were much quicker to move on to a total war footing. You have um, macro measures to control the inflationary gap, keep uh, aggregate demand in line with aggregate supply, but also a barrage of more micro 
oriented controls to make sure that demand and supply uh, in the case of individual goods are brought into line. So you have overall central planning to set priorities, you have rationing to curtail consumer demand, you have production quotas, concentration of production to try to increase efficiency, central manpower budgeting, and central allocation of scarce resources such as steel and capital. So the standard narrative then stresses the limitations of relying on market forces. Um, it also stresses the slowness of governments to learn that lesson during the First World War and the benefits of making a swift transition to a planned economy during the Second World War. Uh, the question that we raise um, here is, is it possible that the lessons were learned too well and that um, the governments had a, a, an unrealistic belief in the efficacy of controls, that they, they sort of took this uh, lesson too far. And then we asked, could it be that this was a factor in the relatively poor performance of the British economy during the post-war period, which was being uh, over-regulated, if you like. We, we must be careful not to uh, overstate that point because uh, you know few historians are going to be persuaded that the success of the British war economy was the due to, all due to the smooth operation of market forces. Um, but on the other hand, maybe the policymakers underestimated the positive effects of Britain's liberal economic inheritance compared to the main rivals, and therefore somewhat overestimated the contribution of government intervention and planning. We can see signs of that in, in the work of Mansur Olsen, uh, writing in the early 1960s. He sort of pointed to this contrast, the fact that um, you know, Britain adopted free trade, um, was dependent on imported food because the agricultural sector uh, contracted. On the other hand, protectionist Germany remained self-sufficient in, uh, in grain production. On the other hand, you know, when you look at the outcomes, Britain survived the submarine blockade um, as its market-oriented farmers were able to respond flexibly, expand output, whilst Germany's peasant farmers tended to withdraw from the market and we see output declining and ultimately uh, collapsing really rather strongly. Uh, this uh, Theo Balderson's work, which highlights the important role of London as a financial center which provided an efficient mechanism for financing the war effort. Also, I think we should not be too mesmerized by Germany's rapid industrialization from the mid 19th century on the basis of protectionism, state intervention, universal banks. It's sometimes forgotten that Britain was substantially richer than Germany at the start of both World War I and World War II, and Britain's steadier, more market-oriented development made for a more flexible economy, better able to withstand the strains of total war. Uh, so um, a positive evaluation of planning during the Second World War uh, also uh, reinforced a disenchantment with the reliance on market forces uh, from the 1930s with the mass unemployment of the Great Depression. Um, although some in the Labour Party advocated a pretty wholesale move to a planned economy after the war, the Labour government, which took power, actually adopted a mixed economy with an emphasis on full employment through Keynesian demand management. Nevertheless, a strong distrust of market forces permeated economic policy after the war. So you have important industries being nationalised, coal, steel, railways, restrictions on competition, which had been strengthened during the war, um, really <coughs> were followed by um, the continuation of a light touch competition policy. Uh, this is something which um, I highlighted with uh, Nick Crafts uh, in some work we did in the 1990, late 1990s, early 2000s. We, we argued that these policies were damaging for Britain's productivity performance during the post-war period and lasted right until the uh, Thatcher years. So I'll stop there and I'll stop 
sharing the screen and hand over to Pauline. Um, I think we will go with uh, Joachim, are you, are you, happy to, are you happy to go? Um, thank you for that, Stephen. And for those who want to ask questions, there's a QA and a box in the bottom right. Please feel free to throw questions in there. Um, and that's how we'll manage it um, at the end of the session. So we'll take them all at the end once the three speakers um, have got down to it. So let me just quickly introduce Joachim, who holds the UBS Chair of Macroeconomics and Financial Markets at the Economics Department at Zurich University. His achievements in terms of publications, grant successes, and public outreach are too many to list here. For our purposes today, it is worth noting that Joachim is a member of the Royal Historical Society, a joint managing editor of the Economic Journal, and an associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Joachim has had three academic books, five popular books, and over 50 articles published by, for example, OUP, Princeton University Press, and indeed the top journals in economics. He's going to talk to us today about Hitler's rise to power. Over to you. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, I have to, just for the record, <clears throat> uh, clarify that I'm neither an editor at the EJ nor an associate editor at the QJ anymore. Um, all good things come to an end. Um, can you see my slides? I'm trying to screen share. Yes, we, we can see them. Okay. So, let me just get going here. Um, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, Hitler's rise to power now in the context of a session on the origins of World War II. Um, it's very hard to think how we could do without uh, mentioning the name of Hitler. Hitler's uh, accession to power in 1933 sets the course um, uh, on which Germany uh, inevitably sooner or later will go to war uh, to uh, reopen the question um, uh, uh, posed by World War I. Um, now, what we want to do, what I'm trying to do in this paper um, is to revisit the issue or the question of what is the importance, what is the role of economic factors in the rise of Hitler to power uh, which then sooner or later maps into uh, World War II and all that is to follow. Now, libraries have been written on the rise of Hitler, uh, uh, looking at the political, cultural, social background. And why do you need another take on this question at all? Well, the striking fact is that, first of all, just so that we're all on the same page, and to give you a little bit of background, the rise of the Nazi party is extraordinarily rapid in the late 20s, early 30s. So if you actually look at the electoral results in 19, as late as 1928, the Nazi party gets 2.6% of the national vote. Two years later, they already jumped to 18%. And then by the summer of 1932, they're the single largest party in Parliament with a 37% share of the vote. Um, by March, they're already in power and they get close to 44% of the vote. Now, <clears throat> the striking thing is that while pretty much everybody who's written about this feels that this meteoric rise over a very short period could never have happened except for the backdrop of the Great Depression, we've never really been able to marshal evidence that shows how economic misery facilitated the rise of the Nazi party. So why is that so difficult? Isn't that obvious? If you just put a time series against the electoral results here, surely that comes out, and that's true, um, as the German economy worsens, as unemployment spirals towards 6 million or so, the electoral results go up. Now, the thing that we don't find easily is indication that misery at the level of individuals or towns, cities, counties predicts support for the Nazi party. So if you go to the most striking measure of distress, unemployment, for example, that has almost no predictive power for how many people vote for the Nazis. So finding something in the cross section with good micro evidence that actually links economic misery with the rise of the Nazi party has been something like the holy grail of this literature. And 
The thing I want to talk about today is a little bit of my own research, but also recent work that uh, Meisner and uh, um, uh, co-authors have done, uh, looking at economic factors driving support for the for the Nazi party. So before we turn to the stuff that I've done with uh, Stefan Gisler, Sebastian Dürr, and um, Jose Luis Pedro, let me just give you a brief summary of uh, what uh, Meisner and Galafredi Lahn co-authors have done. And they've looked at austerity. So austerity is, of course, nothing new. Uh, governments cut expenditure and raise taxes all the time. And they take this to the cross-section in Germany. And this is interesting because it's a very different form of inducing or measuring um, people's economic unhappiness. If you take away their entitlement, they don't have to be poor. They don't have to even be unemployed. It's just that maybe they pay more taxes. Maybe they get less from the state. It's a very visible form in which the government may be failing you. And they find that this actually has substantial predictive power for how the Nazis do. And the difficulty, as always, is sort of understanding why this happens to a greater extent in some places than others. And I think they have some, some nice ways to sort of get around the most obvious challenges. Now, the, the thing that um, uh, we've done in this paper is to take a complementary view and look at one particular set of events that made the Great Depression great. And that's the financial crisis of 1931 in Germany. Germany is not unique in having a financial crisis in 1931 uh, in the US as well as a wave of bank failures, for example. And in both cases, there's a very good argument to be made that what is a bad but garden variety recession previous to the bank failures becomes really the mother of all depressions afterwards. So if you actually look at industrial output uh, on the slide here, you can see how by early 1931, there's a downturn, but it's maybe three and a half, four percent relative to the pre-crisis peak. But then as banks start to fail on a large scale, suddenly you're seeing output declines of 10% during the immediate shutdown of the financial sector, but that carries on until the total output decline in the industry here reaches 18% or so before turning around and starting to rise again. So um, this is what we want to look at. We want to think more whether those parts of Germany exposed to the consequences of this banking crisis are actually the ones where support for the Nazi party increases the most. So just for sort of short background and context, what is this banking crisis? So there's a um, German textile firm called Northwolle that engages in speculation that goes wrong. And because two of the big banks, there's four big banks in Germany at the time, two of them are heavily exposed to this textile firm, uh, Dresdner and Dana. And these two banks fail, and then there's a run on the entire banking system. Every bank has liquidity problems. The government fails to provide a backstop effectively as a result of the constraints of the gold standard. And then there's a generalized um, banking crisis and a moratorium of access to um, the financial system. And then banks need to be recapitalized right, left, and center, and some of them get forcefully merged by the government. So what do we do here? We Let me just show you the main result. We basically divide Germany into two parts. One part has a lot of local exposure to one of these failing banks called Dana. I'll explain in a second why we focus on one and not on the two that fail. And in, that play, in those places where you have a lot of exposure to Danat Bank, the Nazis do much better. So this is the change in support for the Nazi party between September 1930 and July 1932, when they have their big breakthrough. And you can see how those two curves appear sort of shifted to the right for the ones that have Danat exposure. And there's no pre-trends and there's no um, fading away of this effect. So if you actually always, relative to 1930, look at what the electoral success of the Nazi party is, then you can see that prior to 1931, there's nothing in the cross section. There's a small positive effect, but it's tiny and insignificant. And afterwards, this really jumps and it stays high. So what do we do? We collect 
data on from firm directories on who they bank with and because connections in germany between firms and banks are very strong we're pretty much sure that they don't bank with anybody else and we also have information on the places where you have branches and uh, all this nice map is meant to show you is that this is really goes from uh, north to south and east to west uh, in a pretty comprehensive way and what we then do is to say how do you do economically in the diamonds versus blue dots and how do the nazis do um so what we find is this big additional increase for dana but not for grace and that's where it gets interesting because you might say well you know economic misery in both cases things fail why don't you see the same effects well maybe Dresdner's failure didn't have the same economic consequences that turns out to be untrue so one of the contributions of the research here is to actually use income data which has quite severe limitations but nobody's used it uh, in this context before and what you see is that on top of the normal decline of income between 1929 and 1932 in Germany, uh, there's an additional over a third decline in income in areas that have Darnard or Dresdner exposure as measured as I just explained. So there's a big kick uh, to economic performance um, and it's the same for Darnard and Dresdner. Now, if you look at the Nazi voting results, you don't see this at all. They're very different. Only Darnat seems to matter. The question is why? And interestingly, both firms, just like all, uh, both banks, just like all German high finance, has quite a few Jews involved. But Darnat is led by a very flamboyant um, CEO by the name of Jakob Goldschmidt, who becomes a sort of bit noir for the Nazi press. So this is a caricature from what's probably the most anti-Semitic newspaper ever published, Der Stürmer, and it shows the Jewish banker, grotesquely oversized, obese, uh, smiling happily, hanging the honest German businessman. Um, and apparently anti-Semitism in the aftermath of 19, uh, the banking crisis of 1931 becomes so common that uh, even uh, the cabaret makes fun of this generalized tendency to blame everything on the Jews, um, as we cite here on the right hand side. So let me just show you some evidence that this is actually true, that Darnat is being singled out as the scapegoat for this financial crisis. And, uh, this is from uh, mentions of Darnat and crisis in the German speaking press, and you can see how Darnat sort of trumps everything else. Um, after the crisis breaks out in the summer of 1931, but not before. And then if you go to the leading bankers, you can take the ones from Deutsche, Dresdner, uh, Dana is always the same, Goldschmidt just goes through the roof. And the Nazis, when they sort of look back and say, where did our electoral breakthrough come from? So in 1932, when they're sort of patting themselves on the back and say, look how amazingly we've done, the central mouthpiece, the Völkischer Beobachter says, the crisis in the summer of 1931 showed to the bourgeois middle class that we've always been right about the system by which they mean the alleged sort of coterie of Jewish high uh, financiers, uh, Weimar democratic politicians controlling everything in Israel and Germany and collaborating with the Western powers to extract reparations. So what we then go on to do is to say, where's the standard kick benefit for the Nazi party greater. And it turns out to be greatest in those areas where there's pre-existing anti-Semitism. So before 1914, the anti-Semitic parties in Germany already, in those places where you have a uh, Darnat branch or Darnat related firms, uh, you see a much bigger increase in Nazi party voting. Um, where you have a history of pogroms going back all the way to the Middle Ages, it's exactly the same thing. So what do we learn from this? So we know that the electoral rise of the Nazi party coincides with the Great Depression. And in the cross section, we used to have very little evidence that economic fat effects had anything to do with it. Now, because the banking crisis really turns recession into depression, we look at new data on cross-sectional exposure to the financial sector and show how this particular type of connection between financial distress economic downturn 
And problem involvement of Jews helps to basically sell what you would call a hate narrative. It makes it more plausible because seemingly the story of the Nazis are trying to peddle. How the Jews are, are everybody's misfortune in Germany seems to be borne out by the fact because a Jewish led bank fails and creates this wave of misery everywhere. Now leave it there. Many thanks indeed. Thanks, Joachim. Um, right, we're on to number three. We're keeping to time, which is fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And it'll give us a bit of time for questions at the end. Um, Pauline is next. Pauline joins us all the way from Sydney, which is extraordinary. Um, she's a professor in the School of Economics at the University of New South Wales, a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, and a fellow of the Centre for Economic Policy Research. She's worked as an economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and is now getting on close to something like 50 publications. Her list of grand successes is quite something. And if I'm right, she is currently an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Pauline is going to talk to us about how the Second World War shaped political and social trust in the long run. Over to you, Pauline. Thank you very much and thanks for the invitation. Um, I apologize that my camera um, is broken, so you can't see my face, but it's preferable. I think it's preferable at this time, probably. Um, okay, so this is a, a project joint with a bunch of people, and I think I'm gonna talk about um, several papers um, in, in this talk. So um, it's joint with um, a bunch of economists such as Alexander Kassar, Julia Cage, Anna Dagora, and Sami Chaja, and a political scientist at High Point University somewhere. So the, the chapter in itself in the in the ebook um, that I've been invited to talk about um, touches upon the issue of like how war can affect social and political preferences. And from a theoretical point of view, um, there has been quite a you know a lot of work in theory on how war can shape um, social preferences and in particular the influence that it has on parochialism. So the differences between in-group and out-group preferences. So the story is that, you know, if you're attacked by outsiders, you're going to increase your preference for the in-group and possibly decrease your preference for the out-group. Um, however, um, you know, one of the implications of this is that internal conflict might have very different um, effects that international conflicts have. And it's kind of, you know, what we observe um, studying different types of, of civil conflicts um, in previous literature. And so that also suggests that, you know, if we look at World War II in Europe, that might have different consequences on social uh, preferences, depending on the level of infighting that followed um, or, or that took place during the country in countries that were divided or in countries where um, resistance groups opposed um, collaborator groups, for example. Um, there's also been literature on the relationship between war experience, either as a victim or combatant, and collective action. And here the overwhelming um, evidence in the literature points to the fact that either as victim or common and people who are um, involved in the conflict tend to participate more in groups after the conflict ends and participate more in political action. But um, if we look at the, the nature of this political action, we also see that it's not necessarily um, bonding social capital and there's this, you know, what um, others have called the, the dark side of social capital in the sense that these groups may not be necessarily achieving the common good, but the good for these in-groups. So going back to this issue of parochialism, that they might increase the benefits of its members at the expense of outsiders. Um, and so in particular, my co-author Samitra Ja and his co-authors have shown that um, you know, soldiers who had come back with conflict experience had better skill at collective action, and that was used in particular to conduct ethnic cleansing during the partition of India. Um, so the, the chapter in the in the ebook um, that I wrote builds on um, a very interesting survey, in my opinion, but I designed it, so I'm very partial to it. Um, but there was um, there's been several waves of a large scale survey in between 32 and 37 countries, depending on the waves um, in Europe and the former, particularly the former 
communist Europe and some comparing com comparative countries in, um, in Western Europe. And in particular, the 2010 waves of this life in transition survey includes many questions on family victimization in World War II in particular, but also family victimization during the regimes that followed World War II. Um, and there's also questions on displacement. So if we look at the results of this survey, um, we get the graph that I plotted here, which is basically cross-country variation in rates of victimization. And I provide some, some statistics to suggest that that correlates actually quite well with secondary sources on, um, on conflict deaths. So um, in the ebook, if we, if um, what I do basically is a simple exercise of, of correlating these rates of victimization to uh, levels of political trust. Um, it, so trust in central institutions, perceived fairness of court, uh, of courts, as well as generalized trust. So trust in other people, um, as well as measures of collective action. So how much people participate in groups, um, differentiating between um, social groups and, and political parties here in the bottom two corners. And then I differentiate between countries um, you know, that fought on the winning side of the conflict, the losing side, and then countries which were um, divided and that experience, you know, what could be compared to um, a civil war. And across the board, um, we find, um, looking at this data, that people who report a family history of victimization um, are less likely to trust political institutions, um, including courts, um, and also report much higher level of participation in, in groups. Um, and we also, if we look at the age of these respondents in the survey, we find that the effect is quite stable down the generations. And another um, point as well is that, so we see that there is this, this result confirmed about higher victimization leading to more participation in in groups and collective action. And these are the people who have even the worst trust in political um, institutions, so which is consistent with this idea that it's, it's membership in groups that's not necessarily indicative of bonding social capital, but maybe indicative of bridging social capital. Um, so um, I, I briefly, in the five minutes that I've got left, I wanna to talk to you about um, another series of projects that I have um, on the, the two world wars and political development in Europe that enables you know, to understand a little bit more the, the mechanism underlying some of these aggregate relationship um, that I document in the ebook. So in particular, I have a, a paper uh, with my co-authors looking at um, the, the effect of um, combat heroism during, first world war, during the First World War on the propensity to collaborate during World War II and even the long-term consequences um, of this throughout um, different elections in France during the interwar and after the Second World War. So what we use in this paper, we use the incidental assignment of um, General Philippe Pétain, who was then general and then made marshal at the end of the First World War, and the arbitrary rotation of line infantry regiments at the, um, during the First World War. Um, so for this paper, we use a, a file, an intelligence file that was collected in 1945 on more than 97,000 collaborators. And we augment this data set. So we also collect other sources of data on collaboration from the OSS, um, as well as a, a more precise data set on a subset of collaboration, which was the Legion of French Volunteers, who were people who volunteered to go and fight on the Eastern Front under a Wehrmacht uniform. And we've got about 9,000 of these, of these people. And that includes people who died on the front, people who volunteered, but were turned away. And so what we find in this paper is that using the fact that some municipalities were assigned to regiments that arbitrarily were rotated under Pétain at Verdun, when it came to um, political choices and political action during the Second World War, when Pétain became um, the dictator of France and collaborated with Germany, we find that the regiments that had been arbitrarily assigned to him in combat at Verdun have higher shares of collaborators by about 7% and lower um, members of the resistance, by, uh, of the civilian resistance by about um, 8%. And we also find that this is associated with a persistent political advantage to the right that starts forming during the interwar and that um, that um, remain significant after, even after the Second World War, and in particular, lasting up until the 1980s and being quite large in magnitude. So we find about a 6 percentage point advantage to the right 
in post-World War II France in those municipalities that were um, assigned to combat under Pétain at Verdun. Um, so this is related to a, a recent and quite exciting literature on the effect of, um, of different events of World War II on further political development. So there's a series of paper in Italy, um, as well as the um, a, a series of work also on the impact of World War I military death on political development. So, um, so it's loosely related because we're not looking at the impact of, of military death, but just the rotation of regiment under, under Pétain and Verdun. But there is um, what I think is a quite interesting literature allowed namely by the, the availability of data on, on World War I individual records of fatalities. Um, and there is also, uh, you know, some, some literature that um, Joachim uh, has contributed to on the effect of the scars of the conflict on consumer choice. Um, so I'm going to go in two minutes summarizing um, our paper on, on collaboration um, and the, the long term political um, effects. So, um, so yeah, so our context is World War II France, um, where you know Marshal Pétain becomes a dictator of France pretty much and puts in place an authoritarian, conservative, and repressive regime that that collaborates uh, with the Nazi Germany until France's liberation in June 1942. Um, so Pétain was a very important guy because he was lionized as the hero of the, the, the very important battle of Verdun in, in World War One. Um, and so what we do is that uh, we collect information on each of the regiments. So here, a pattern of color here is about the catchment of a, of a regiment in the First World War. And what we use is we use the rotation of these regiments at the Battle of Verdun, differentiating those who serve under uh, Pétain at the start of the battle, so during these three months, and the others um, who were rotated at the, at the battle at a later date. Um, and uh, we also collect a bunch of data on um, voting results at the level of each of 35,000 uh, 35, municipalities in France. Um, and we check that, you know, so basically here the picture that emerges is that these municipalities are uh, that were rotated under Pétain or not are exactly similar to others before the war. But what we observe is that after the war, and they're even uh, similar in terms of uh, fatality rate right, during World War I, but what we observe is that these municipalities, you know, consistent with Pétain's own choices, uh, collaborate more um, with uh, the occupant or in you know, the milice or paramilitary group that support the regime during uh, World War II. And the effect is very robust, you know, whatever specification that we use, and to a wide uh, right range of controls. And in the last um, minute, or I'm maybe out of time, um, I just want to you know, to talk to you about uh, political consequences um, of this thing or, um, you know, how this is associated with political choices. Um, and so what we observe is that during the interwar, we find that these municipalities that had been uh, rotated under Pétain start voting more for the right and particularly the extreme right in the 1936 election. And we found that the effect is durable even after um, World War II. Um, so this is the effect, you know, so this is uh, well, I'm just going to show you this last slide that shows that, you know, you've got an average six percentage point advantage to the right in those municipalities that were rotated at Pétain, at Verdun under Pétain, that also collaborated more until the late 1980s. And you see that this effect is particularly strong in times of social and political crisis in France. So uh, in particular, you know, in the context of the Algerian war or social unrest of 1968, or even in the context of what was at the time a very scary election of the first socialist president um, in 1981. Um, and yeah, to show you, you know, the, the, the sort of long-term effect that this has also on social preferences. This is um, the, the share of children who are named Philippe um, after uh, Philippe Pétain in France. So you see that there's this big spike when um, Pétain becomes, um, uh, when Pétain assumes power in 1940. But then in 1951, when he dies, you have these big clashes um, throughout France between veterans who support him and, and other people. And what you actually see is that you, at his death, you have an even bigger spike um, in the name of 
in the in the share of newborns who are named Philippe. So that's kind of a if you want a, an illustration of the long term social consequences um, through naming patterns. And I think I'm going to stop here. Um, but um, just to say that you know this is part of an exciting body of work that look at the through line of both world wars on political developments in 20. A century Europe, and I think we know that, you know, if we look at um, current news, we know that these undercurrents are very important. So, you know, there has been many reference to the Blitz in the UK in recent years. Um, the symbolism of World War II is very important in Russia, and even Emmanuel Macron, um, you know, used the the word the the words that Georges Clemenceau had used to talk about the the former soldiers of World War One to commend um, doctors and nurses during the COVID crisis. And that's it. Thank you, Pauline. Super stuff. Thank you to all three speakers um, for providing us with um, some really fascinating insights. I mean, I think sometimes mass statistics can seem remote, impersonal almost, but your presentation show us that looking at the experience of people through the lens of data allows us to better understand arguably the agency of individuals and communities um, during this extraordinary period of conflict and indeed change. So we have, we have questions coming in. We have a good 15 minutes and, and the, the panelists have very kindly agreed to, to bleed a little bit over time if, if that is necessary. Um, the first question came in early from Alex, um, who's one of our um, regional directors in the group. And he said, there's, I think it's directed towards Stephen. There is a strong move in the historiography towards placing Britain's war in its imperial context. Do we, have a do we have convincing economic data that looks at the war from the perspective of the empire rather than solely from the United Kingdom? And if so, what, what does it tell us? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Um, one of the things that we do in, in both of the hard copy books <laughs> that go back a bit earlier to the early 2000s um, was to um, add up uh, resources supplied by the different countries on the two sides. And you, you get some interesting insights from that because I think we, we subscribe to the view that in the long run, the outcomes really depend on the resources um, devoted um, on both sides. And, um, but of course, participant, you get some interesting changes in who the participants are. So in the World War II, uh, if we, we get a different answer, um, to the balance of resources on the two sides. If we look um, at the beginning of the war, when neither the US nor Russia are on the Allied side. So, um, but one of the things we did was to count to count up uh, resources. Then, now, uh, in terms of of uh, supply of soldiers, um, I think you know the empire can be um, quite important. But in terms of overall resources, um, it's much, much smaller. And, and part of the reason for that, I think, is, is that um, it is, is that you, you have to have, have to be a relatively rich country to supply a lot of resources for fighting wars. Um, and in, in, in a total war, if, you, if you're a poor country where most people are um, supplying their labor to, to just to produce produce the uh, food clothing and housing you know you don't have much to draw on so i think the the scale of the uh, contribution of the empire um, looks bigger if we do it in terms of labor and the providing the soldiers but if you look at it in terms of uh, total resources i mean somewhere like india or the african colonies uh, are not really able to supply very much because they're relatively poor can you stay on there, Stephen? So Alan Allport, who's got up at seven o'clock this morning in the United States to dial in, um, has thanked the speakers. And he, he asks you a question about the growth of real GDP in both world wars. So it seems from the graph that the point of departure in the Second World War is one year after the start of the war, i.e. 1940 compared to 1915. Is one part of the explanation for the greater rise in British real GDP in World War II, the military course of the war. So in 1915, Britain was expanding its army, but there was no immediate emergency. France and Russia was still fighting. In 1940, France fell and Britain had to take on the burden of the war by itself, plus empire, of course. So had France not fallen, in other words, 
would the two curves of the First and Second World Wars look much more alike, regardless of lessons learned? Thank you. Right. Well, so I've, I've put up this, this, this slide here. Um, I think um, what's happening here is that in the in the first year, um, things are very similar. And indeed, as we go into the second year, uh, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, it's really in the th by the third year that we're, I, 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 I would explain it more by sort of the, the capacity of the economy in the First World War to, to go on increasing um, output. Um, so that you remember in, in, in World, in, when World War II starts out, um, you still have a lot of unemployment. Uh, whereas World War One is starting off from pretty much full employment, so um, so I think that's perhaps why you get a, a, a bigger increase in the Second World War. Um, I, I mean, I, I still think. I mean, yeah. I mean, early, earlier on as well um, in in the in in the First World War, it seems to me that they're they're looking fairly similar in the first two years um, and by the third year they're running into capacity constraints. I think that's perhaps the, the best way I can make sense of that. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here um, from Professor David Edgerton, which I will come to in a second, David, if you will allow. I just want to direct a question before towards our other two speakers. Um, the data, to me at least, seems to shine a light on the issue of equality. Um, it runs like a thread through the ebook, I think, um, it, you know, quality and fairness in terms of the causes, conduct and cons consequences of the war. I guess, to what extent was the search for I mean, social justice and fairness the lifeblood of the conflict? And that seems to re resonate very strongly with your paper, Joachim, on how individuals experienced the depression, experienced the crises that, have, that, it, that emerged in the 1930s. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, of course, the Nazis are radically in favor of equality in all sorts of dimensions, right? So, getting rid of class differences, for example, is one of the things uh, that they love. If you watch the Leni Riefenstahl movie uh, from the 1930s, uh, they even have this sort of symbolic act where people from different corners of Germany, Saxons, Thuringians, Bavarians, all become Germans in some equal sense. But of course, that's in the context of extreme emphasis on differences, where there's one race that's the good one and the right one and everything else is ready for extermination. So I think, uh, you know, there's clearly two sides to them. And you could probably argue that they are actually intimately connected, that uh, an important part of what makes the German military so extremely effective in World War II is actually creating very cohesive groups of people who think of themselves as equals, reducing the difference between officers and men perceived and in terms of treatment and privilege and so forth, but that then is basically used for the purpose of establishing the superiority of one group over all others. Pauline, do you want to jump in or do you want to address uh, Michael Keegan's question and then we'll come to David? So um, Mike yeah, so I was actually uh, answering Michael's question in the chat, but maybe um, I can answer it live. So uh, the question is whether the goal confuses um, our right-left analysis of the French, as the goal was also from the right, and even named his child after Pétain, who was his career sponsor. The information on child naming is very interesting. Do you think admiration for Pétain remains to any significant extent today in France? So um, the... It's, it's on our to-do list, um, and I'm sorry that we haven't done this yet, um, to code exactly you know, what election. Um, so so the, the election results is for the legislative election. So it's not really for the presidential elections where you know, that role could play a more important role. Um, but still, you know, I think it's important to code exactly you know, when he was around and when he wasn't, um, and clearly, you know, the 1958 uh, results have just said this may be part of our story. And also I want to say that it's not a story. The post-World War I right-wing result is not the extreme right. I mean, this is tricky because the extreme right, you know, appears later on in France. But even after it appears, it's clearly not 
support, higher support for the extreme right that we see in those places. It's really support for you know, the traditional right, which in France, in the context of, of the time period that we look at is, you know, still quite organized around, you know, strong men, but it's not, it, it, it's not the extreme right. Um, so the, to the extent that admiration for Pétain remains to any significant extent today in France, it absolutely does. And it's actually surprising. And, and it, you know, this is actually quite controversial um, to say anything bad about, against Pétain. Uh, it seems very bizarre, but a lot of people still remain attached to his um, status as this heroic figure and, and systematically downplay whatever role he, whatever negative role he may have um, played in the Second World War. Um, and yeah, and, and I think in particular among young people, you know, people say, yeah, they, He's the the positive aspect of whatever he did, and especially especially in the first world war, is is still very much present. And the fact that he was a hero and he did all these great things for France, and um, the negative role still downplayed. Yeah, and De Gaulle actually, you know, himself commuted his death sentence, um, and he was not executed after the war, even though he was sentenced to death. Yeah. Can I bring it back then to, to you, Stephen? Um, so David uh, Edgerton has asked, uh, would you agree that you're using a particular definition of economic history since many economic historians, self-defined, have contributed a lot to the understanding of the economics of the Second World War, especially Poston, Gowing, Overy, Millward, Pedden, et cetera? Uh, yes, well, I, I think um, I would stand by my claim that it's still an under-researched area. Um, and, um, you know, the names we have here, Post and Gowing, they, they were writing the official history of the Second World War. And I think uh, you know, there's no doubt that that literature is, um, is a great resource um, of, with very detailed um, writing up of, of, of um, really work based around min ministries, I guess. Um, so, so administrative issues, really. I don't think there's any doubt that that's a, a terrific literature, but it does seem to have had the effect of, um, uh, of, of you know, we, we still think of those as the main, um, the main writings. And, um, you know, uh, you, you certainly, Overy and Millward and Peden have, uh, have, have um, added things, but it's, if you look at a, an economic history journal, um, you know, you just don't see most economic historians working on, on the wars. So, and so I, I just think it's been rather neglected. And if you're writing a, a sort of textbook summary, um, it's still going to lean very heavily on this uh, literature uh, from, from the war histories. Thank you, Stephen. We've, we've a question for um, our two other panellists, and then I might sneak in a final question myself at the end if I'm allowed. So um, an anonymous attendee has said, thank you for presenting this illuminating research and data. Wondering if the presenters found anything specific that surprised them about the data from the other presenters' research that they'd previously not considered. And you might broaden that out actually to the other papers in the ebook, or that they found particularly supported or refuted their own evidence. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I might jump my question on top of that, which was I was struck by how um, in, in one of the papers by uh, Clemens that the GDP of occupied Europe in 1938, well, that would become occupied Europe in 1938, it was equal to the GDP of the United States in 1938. And that surprised me. So, you know, the extent to which the Allies, you know, the, the narrative goes that the, it was a massive mismatch economically between the Allies and the Axis, but the Axis did have occupied Europe. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on whether we should reflect again on some of those core economic arguments about the, 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 the inequality between the two sides. So over, over to you, whoever wants to have a crack at that. Uh, well, perhaps I could say a few things there because uh, we did um, in, in the, uh, the hard copy <laughs> book that we, wrote, that we did on, on, on World, that Mark Harrison edited on World War II, we did, we did provide the resources on the two sides and we do know that the, you know, the, the change, change in the balance with the um, Soviet Union switching sides, the US coming in and so on. Um, but I think one, th yeah, one thing to remember is um, that 
the United States, the, the, the people supported coming in. Um, and in Britain, people supported the war effort. It's much harder to extract resources from somewhere that you invade. And, they, um, and, and so there's lots of cases of this um, going back further in history too. It, it's quite hard to extract resources from uh, a, a resisting um, country. And so I think it's not just, that's not the same as having um, willing uh, participants. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in about any other papers that sparked new ideas in your heads? Okay, I'll move to, to Neil Carey. He says, do you think, um, so I think Joachim, this is addressed at you. And um, do you think that this analysis of the reasons for Nazi electoral success sheds light on their later mismanagement of the early wartime economy, e.g. their refusal to prepare for protracted war to mobilize the female, female population, etc. So I think the, the research that I presented has almost nothing to do with that particular question, but it's very clear in the early 1930s already that the Nazis have no understanding of economics. I mean, the, um, until they get some professional help uh, by people like Jan Schacht, uh, the party is full of uh, people with very crazy ideas like feeder money uh, that loses its value and it's not used to transactions and stuff like that. And it's pretty clear that they just feel that this is all a matter of will and that, uh, you know, inflation is a matter of uh, discipline. So even the most basic things about how to manage an economy and that an economy is not just like a large firm they're missing the understanding of all of this. And in some ways, the fact that they come to power at the moment when the German economy is already turning without anything that they do um, is a blessing for the Nazi regime, but it's also a curse because they never really have to sort of start thinking uh, hard and fast about what it takes to turn a country around. And then you get this completely lexadaisical management of the German war effort later on, which is really just a continuation of what, uh, what's gone on before, uh, with the expectation that everything will fall in their lap, right? Thank you. Can I, I have one final question that's come through to me um, on, by text, um, because I think someone is struggling on the uh, IT front. Um, question for Pauline, and we'll, we'll, we'll round off with this. Um, the sheer volume of data in your work is phenomenal. What are the key methodological lessons that you learned over the duration of your studies? How much groundwork do you need to undertake to see whether data sets exist in the first place? How should one best frame these really profound research questions? Um, so thank you for the question. The, the framing, I'm still, you know, open for suggestion and advice on that. Um, <laughs> um, the, the data, I mean, this is the, the, the project on France. We started 11 years ago. Um, and I think, I think the, the, the big challenge is that I think a lot of previous studies of France are generally done at the department level or maybe at the electoral canton level, which, and you know, you've got 90 departments or 4,000 canton in the best of cases. We've got 35,000 municipalities. So I think matter of scale this is really really um a big step up and allows us to have a much more refined analysis and that meant yeah that meant 10 years of data collection and in particular collecting all that data on electoral results at the municipal level was a big task and i think the data on collaboration honestly um yeah we just we got lucky <laughs> this was a picture of us going into the basement of someone who's a secretary of the Institut Jean Moulin in Bordeaux who had taken pictures of those files and we took pictures of his pictures because this data is actually not made public still because it's very politically sensitive. I mean, we have a lot of information on these people. We have their address, their names, their the nature of their collaboration activities and, and nothing happened to these people. So these are active collaborators. Um, but these are people, you know, who were still alive in 1944, 1945. And the, this is the, the medium range, if you want. So these people who were active, but not the top end of collaboration. 
which we get from the OSS data on high-end collaborators. Um, but this is generally, you know, generally people who were um, not punished, but probably also because of the scale of their and their and the fact that, you know, they had important jobs for these places, and so it would have been very disruptive to to do anything um, against them. Um, but yeah, I think it's a matter of luck. And then I think for the life in transition survey, I mean, this is still a survey that I think is is very interesting. I don't think this data has been um, fully utilized. I mean, I think there is a series of papers now that you that has used this data to look at the relationship with electoral results in different countries of Europe. Um, so, but you know, I always encourage people to actually look at this survey because um, I think there's many interesting questions. And and for me, it was just a matter of luck because I was actually working at the European Bank for reconstruction development when we did the first wave um, of this survey. And then I was involved in the in all the later rounds. And so I, I was able to add the questions that I wanted. So. Thank you. Um, if, if the attendees will forgive me, we better draw stumps. Um, we've gone over our time and the, the speakers have been very generous and giving us a little bit of extra um, on a Thursday afternoon. So, so thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you, especially to our three speakers. You provided us with insights in terms of sources, methodologies. You provided us with some fascinating perspectives. It certainly made me think again about agency and how statistics can be used to underpin my own research. And I'm sure it's the same for many who are attending and will indeed hopefully listen to it down the line. The session has been recorded. And um, so please do pass it on to friends and colleagues who may well be interested in this. And we will return hopefully with more from our global seminar series um, in the new academic year. So thank you again, everybody. Have a, a safe summer and we'll hopefully reconnect in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.